eight hours of sleep. That's what they tell us. But how many of us actually get to sleep and rest properly? How many of us keep those rules? Some of us only get five, six, or even four hours of sleep a night. Then we also work longer hours with less time to rest over the weekends. Dr. Bruce is back for part two, where he's teaching us how to boost our immune systems with proper rest and proper sleep. Now, you are going to love this session. And remember, he's got years of experience working in Ireland, Australia, and England. Now also friends, don't forget that we still have that free gift available to you. It is extra content where we go through these topics in a much deeper way. I don't want you to lose out on that. So please check the description for the link and sign up. It'll take you five seconds. Now let's enjoy the session with Dr. Bruce. I'll chat to you at the end. Good morning, friends. I want to welcome you back to another session uh, that we have time, some time to share together. And it's my privilege to share some information with you that I hope will be a blessing for your life. And uh, the main thing with these uh, lectures and seminars is that we implement and put into practice what we learn. Uh, information is one thing. Knowledge is power only as or to the degree that it's implemented. So I want to encourage you to get excited about your health. There's a few greater gifts that we've been given than our health. Today we're going to look at a very important topic in health, um, how sleep affects our immunity. And we're going to touch on sleep and immunity, but then we're going to look at practical ways. Th some of the things that are causing us not to sleep well, and ways we can, things we can do to counteract that and to sleep like babies again. Um, most of us love a good night's sleep, and we all know, unfortunately, what we feel like when we don't sleep. So let's look at sleep and immunity and ways we can optimize this free master, I call it the free master restorer and regenerator. Sleep is a gift. We spend a third of our lives doing it. Um, if you live for 90 years, you'll have slept for 30 years. Think about that. Isn't that amazing? So just to start off with, those who sleep poorly are more likely to get sick when exposed to a virus. During sleep, the immune system releases these chemical medias that we spoke of um, yesterday called cytokines, and Dr. Evelyn, I think, would have touched on as well. Um, and they, these cytokines mobilize the immune system. And basically, like I said yesterday, when the immune system gets exposed to an invader, it breaks that invader up and presents it to the rest of the cells uh, via a thing called an antigen-presenting cell. And then there are little cells called t uh, uh, helper T cells. And... Uh, some of these are called CD4 cells. And these are the cells that are affected, for instance, by H the HIV virus. And these CD4 cells are really important. They release a whole chemical milieu called cytokines. And the cytokines mobilize other arms of the immune system and bring them to the area where the infection is and tell the immune system, do this, do that, don't do that. So the way the immune cells communicate with each other is via these cytokines. And during sleep, the body releases these cytokines to deal with infections. When we don't sleep, we don't get the same cytokine release. Insufficient sleep also decreases a number of antibodies and um, the immune cell numbers itself. So the number of immune cells that we have. Sleep deprivation raises cortisol. And we spoke about the dangers of chronically elevated cortisol and the impact that it has on your immune system. So particularly decreasing things like secretory IgA and some of your mucosal barriers like the gut. So... Um, moving on, the immune system also rejuvenates and repairs during sleep. So during the day, we're using a lot of energy for many processes. And during the night, the body has a chance to repair and rejuvenate. And one of the things that rejuvenates is the immune system. Sleep reestablishes a complementary action between the hormones and the immune system. Sometimes there's a dissonance or discordance that happens with some of our daily hormones in our immune system. And healthy sleep helps to reset the relationship between our hormones and the immune, immune system communication. Sleep deprivation, we said, also increases inflammation. And inflammation is the buzzword of 21st century medicine. We said many chronic conditions are related to a chronically inflamed state inside the body, and particularly in the brain. Um, sleep disruption increases immune dysregulation, which increases your autoimmune risk. So autoimmunity has become a very topical buzzword in, in the times we live in. Many people are battling with chronically inflamed systems and an immune system that has become dysregulated. So essentially, autoimmunity is a loss of that process where we learn to recognize ourselves. In the thymus gland we spoke of yesterday, 
when, when someone has an autoimmune condition, they've lost a bit of self-tolerance. Their immune system starts to think that their own tissue is foreign. And that's the basis for autoimmunity. A lack of sleep increases your risk of getting an autoimmune condition. Conversely, um, various immune factors can actually affect the quality of your sleep as well. So a pro-inflammatory state, if you're dealing with a chronically inflamed system, that can also affect the depth and quality of your sleep. So those are some of the impacts that sleep deprivation has on our immune systems. Important key point, take home. Restorative quality sleep is both imperative for and the barometer of good brain health. What do, I, what do I mean by that? A healthy brain sleeps well and healthy sleep creates a healthy brain. So a real key indicator of how healthy you are and how you're doing is the quality of your sleep. A healthy brain will allow healthy sleep. And there's a number of things that can affect that process, which we'll touch on today. The thing to bear in mind is that our brains are the greatest gifts we've been given. The organ through which we impact the world is yeah, inside our heads. We don't impact the world through our liver or our kidney. We impact the world through our personalities, which are seated in our brains. So I want to encourage you, become a super sleeper. Become passionate about healing your brain. And um, this is the organ that determines our success in life, how much we battle with things, how we deal with conflict, how we interact socially, how cognitively we function, how well we do you know, uh, educational tasks, a whole host of things. Um, if you want to be a successful human, this is where it starts and ends. So let's do some work on that. And sleep is a key part of that. So let's commit to mastering it. Sleep deprivation, how bad is it? Well, 50 to 70 million US adults have a sleep disorder. 48% snore, and snoring we'll see is not funny. Snoring is dangerous, and the worse snoring gets, um, the worse for you. 25 million people in the US have obstructive sleep apnea. 35.3% report less than seven hours sleep in a 24 hour period. A hundred, how about this one? A hundred thousand deaths in hospitals occur each year due to medical errors. Sleep deprivation makes a significant contribution. It's actually crazy that sometimes the people dealing with life and death decisions often get the least sleep. And so in sometimes for us people in the medical game, helping other people get well threatens our own health. So we need to find that balance. Consequences of poor sleep. Fatigue, poor work performance, decreased cognition, and focus, altered mood, and it promotes a pro-inflammatory state which we've spoken quite a bit about and impairs immunity. Important point to note is you can sleep and not sleep. Just the fact that you go to bed and wake up eight hours later doesn't mean that you've had quality sleep necessarily. How do you feel when you wake up? Um, do you feel grotty and brain fogged? Do you feel we have a dry mouth? Do you feel that your lips are chapped? Have you been snoring? We're supposed to wake up energized, just like eating is supposed to give us resources and fuel for life, to do life. Sleep is supposed to rejuvenate us. If you're not experiencing rejuvenating sleep, something is amiss and you need to work on it. So we should be able to wake up refreshed without the need for an alarm clock uh, to wake up. How many of us can do that? And the brain loves, and the brain and the body generally loves regularity. We operate on cycles. We've been designed to operate on light levels. So getting some early morning sunshine helps to reset our circadian clocks. Getting light at night is not good for our sleep. We're supposed to get a light in the beginning of the day and get less and less light or light in the more infrared spectrum towards the end of the day. The brain picks up on those emission changes in light throughout the course of a normal day. Both quantity and quality matter in sleep. So what happens during normal healthy sleep? It used to be thought that sleep was a totally inactive process, but that is now found to be not the case. The brain is shifting into a different phase when we sleep. It's shifting into a rest, regeneration, repair, restore phase. And if we optimize that time for it to do that, we wake up feeling like we're ready for the next day. Like I said in the first talk, our day is only as good as the previous night's sleep. And many of us can attest to that. So what's going on when we sleep? We've got growth hormone release and tissue repair. 
And that's also affected by, for instance, what we have for supper and how late we eat. Having a diet high in refined carbohydrates late at night will switch off your growth hormone release and you won't get that kind of tissue repair. So you're actually gonna be aging your system. Detoxification, the body uses the sleep time to detoxify through the liver, detoxify the brain. Brain cleansing, which is a fascinating new discovery, which we'll talk about. Memory consolidation, the things that you've put into the system during the course of a day that you've processed if you're a student or an academic, you want to consolidate that and put it into the long-term memory banks and that's happening during normal sleep. Emotional processing. Most of us can identify with times where we haven't slept enough. I know I can. <laughs> where we've flown off the handle. If we're we haven't slept, we're tired and the smallest thing will make us lose our, t lose our cool. So emotionally labile people are often people that are not getting quality sleep because emotional processing and settling down and chewing on things happens while we sleep. Cortisol regulation and the cortisol awakening response. Cortisol is supposed to go through this diurnal cycle that we touched on yesterday, highest at 8 o'clock in the morning and lowest at 11 o'clock at night. In a healthy person, our cortisol, while low at night, starts to rise towards the morning and it's actually the cortisol level that's increasing that helps your brain wake up. So for instance, people that have burnout, that have really pushed the pedal to the metal with stress and, and long-term threats and, 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 and worry, they've worn out their cortisol system. So they have a blunted morning cortisol awakening response. They take a while. They'll find that their brain doesn't wake up till 11, 12 o'clock because they've got a dampened cortisol awakening response. So health involves getting that back in balance. Balances the immune system during normal sleep, like we said. Balances the appetite. If you don't sleep, you tend to want to eat rubbish. Have you noticed that? On night shift and times at the hospital, if I have been up the whole night, again, I don't feel like eating broccoli. I feel like eating stuff that's not good for me. So our appetites are fundamentally controlled and regulated by the sleep process. So the, some of the hormones there are ghrelin and leptin, which are controlled during sleep. So sleep deprivation can actually lead to weight gain by not controlling those kind of hormones. So what does a normal sleep uh, study look like? This is what's called normal sleep architecture. We go through cycles of about 90 minutes where we go through, most of us know about non-REM sleep and REM sleep. The REM sleep proportion increases as we head towards the morning. So we get more and more REM sleep we're supposed to as we head towards the morning, which is the dreamlike state that we're supposed to experience. Sleep used to be divided, in, used to be divided into four stages. They're now subdivided into three. Most important is the deep sleep. Deep, uh, the deep phases of sleep, which are characterized by waves called delta waves on the EEG. So the body's doing various things during these stages of sleep. When we fall asleep, we go through stage uh, N1 sleep, N2 sleep, and then N3 sleep, which is the deep sleep. And then we come up again, we go through REM, and then we go back down the cycle, and then REM, and then non-REM, and REM and non-REM. And that's how we're supposed to cycle, you know, through the course of the night. The body is really resting and regenerating during this deep sleep phase. And um, they've picked up, interestingly enough, which I'll probably touch on just now, the delta waves that are a sign of deep sleep, which is the kind of sleep that we need to be getting to restore and rejuvenate. Mm -hmm. These can be augmented by various types of music, for instance. They've found, scientists have, sleep scientists have found that if they play a certain sound that's in harmony with the deep sleep uh, delta waves, you actually can augment that deep sleep state and people get uh, clinical benefits. So the point is a lot is happening. Hormones are being secreted, tissues being repaired. The body is rejuvenating during those deep sleep phases. So those are some of the things that are happening during stages N3 and uh, formerly stages three and four. Um, blood pressure drops, breathing becomes relaxed, muscles are relaxed, and energy is restored. So if you're not getting to deep sleep, you're not gonna restore your energy. You can wake up tired still. REM sleep um, provides energy to the brain. Um, supports daytime performance, the brain is active and dreams occur, and the eyes dart back and forth. And during REM sleep, we're actually paralyzed to prevent us from acting out our dreams. As you can appreciate, especially if you spend in sleep with somebody in bed, um, if you're dreaming and you're busy acting out your dream, you're gonna clobber your spouse regularly, which is quite hazardous. So it's quite convenient that we're uh, paralyzed during REM sleep. So these are some of the EEG waves we'll see on um, on a studying person at, in sleep, and we'll see there there's delta waves in stage three sleep or non-REM non uh, delta sleep. During deep sleep, glucose metabolism in the brain increases, which supports short-term and long-term memory consolidation and overall learning. 
Deep sleep is also when the pituitary gland secretes important hormones, like growth hormone, leading to growth, development, and repair of the body. Point being, you no need normal sleep architecture. You need a right amount of proportion of, of light and deep sleep and REM sleep for the body to really get the benefit of sleeping, to rest and regenerate. And there are various things that are causing people not, many people are now not getting to the deep sleep phases. Um, and therefore they are aging faster. So if you find yourself getting age, aging faster than you feel like you should, perhaps it's your sleep. Sorry, just go one back. Deep sleep is how we convert interactions during the day into our long-term memory and personalities, characterized by delta waves, like I said. As we get older, we lose the capacity to enter this delta wave sleep. So the amount of delta wave sleep has been suggested as a marker for biological aging or biological youth. Um, so, message, you need enough deep sleep. And how much is enough? The average adult needs about 1.5 to 1.8 to 2 hours of deep sleep a night in terms of a proportion of the total sleep duration. Um, research suggests that REM sleep, uh, when we have the most powerful dreams, is vital to learning and creativity, promotes a healthy mind in a variety of ways. So literally, if we stifle our dreams, we aren't going to reach our potential. REM sleep helps us to be creative and rejuvenates mm -hmm. the mind. Another important um, system that we, has been discovered fairly recently is uh, the glymphatic system. Now, we've known for a long time that the body has a lymphatic system, which we spoke of previously, but it wasn't known until fairly recently that the body has this glymphatic system, as it was called or coined, um, which is amazing. So basically, when we enter deep sleep phases, and only during deep sleep, and this is important, the brain is cleaning itself out. So during the course of the day, there's been leakage of extracellular material or intracellular material into the extracellular space inside the brain. Proteins, protein fragments, toxins, and that's sitting into the, in, in the intercellular space or in the brain tissue substance outside of the blood vessels. When we get to deep sleep, the brain exudes from its vessels, it exudes CSF type fluid, which then washes through the brain parenchyma and cleans out these, these proteins and fragments and things that shouldn't be there. And one of the things that the scientists found is that it's cleaning out is these amyloid be beta plaques, uh, beta, beta amyloid plaques, which are risk factors for Alzheimer's. So one of the recent theories with, with Alzheimer's dementia is that people that have sleep disturbances that don't get to this deep sleep phases um, are failing to get the brain to clean out. So the brain is busy doing house cleaning. It's clearing out junk that doesn't belong in the brain tissue. And it sweeps it through the brain tissue and back into the, the veins to get rid of. And that goes obviously to the liver and the liver processes those things. So, and again, only happens during delta wave sleep. So we need to make sure we get deep sleep for the brain to clean itself out. Now, I like this picture. This is what the brain's busy doing with the glymphatic system. It's cleaning itself and scrubbing. Practically, again, I like to get practical. What do we need to do to sleep properly? How do we sleep well? Number one, choose to optimize your sleep environment. If you expect to sleep with a light shining in your eye, music blaring, and things disturbing you, you're not going to. You need to create an environment for optimum sleep. That's a dark environment. Try and get blackout curtains. Make sure your room is as dark as possible. They've even found, science has found, that the smallest amount of light, so light controls an area in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus via um, the pineal gland and melatonin. And basically, through the retina, uh, the retina is feeding back to these structures in the brain. And when it senses that there's light, it inhibits the sleep pathways. Any, they found that even the smallest amount of light particularly blue light, which we should get in the beginning of the day, switches off your melatonin production, which is necessary for sleep. So how the brain works is it takes the serotonin that it makes in the first part of the day and converts that at night to melatonin to help us sleep. So, and they, they did an experiment where they took a very small light source and put that light source behind someone's knee in a dark room. And they found scientifically that that was enough to disturb the melatonin production. Point being, you want a dark room. You want to eliminate extraneous sources of light, step number one. If necessary, wear a mask. Get comfortable wearing a mask to block out light. Um, 
We all know about the risk of screens nowadays with blue light being emitted from our cell phones and tablets and TVs. If you're going to insist on watching a screen, which is not the best thing before bed, make sure that you've got the F.Lux program on your Mac or the equivalent on, on a PC, or you're using a device in your smartphone that cuts out the blue light. It's the blue light that tells your brain that it's morning. You can't expect to sleep well if your brain thinks that it's morning. Um, temperature. They found that the best temperature to sleep at is around 18 degrees. You don't want a room that's too hot. The body cools down as it starts to go towards sleep. So you want a temperature that matches that process. You want a comfortable bed, mattress and pillow. You know, if you've got something that's constantly a spring that's sticking in your back, you're not going to sleep well. Regularity. The brain and the body love regularity. Choose a bedtime that works with your program. The earlier, the better. Far better to go to bed early and get up early than to go to bed late and get up late. Not the same sleeping after midnight as it is before. And students that practice this technique find that if they, we need about eight hours. There's always 24 hours in a day. If you go to bed at 8.30, get up at 4.30, or go to bed at 8, get up at 4, still the same number of hours in the day, but you'll perform better in those early hours of the morning after rest. So find a time that works for your schedule and stick to it. Regularity is important. Number two, balance. To sleep well, you need to balance your brain. So this sounds really obvious, but depression, anxiety, burnout are rife. And the th pressures of modern life are wearing people down. And you will not sleep well without a complementary or balanced set of neurotransmitters. There are neurotrans I love neuroscience. It's absolutely fascinating. There are neurotransmitters that speed the brain up. Things like dopamine and acetylcholine and histamine. Histamine is also a neurotransmitter. Uh, and there are things, the neurotransmitters that slow the brain down. Things like serotonin and GABA. Um, so to be a balanced person, to sleep well, you need to have harmony between these neurotransmitter systems. Those systems that are accelerating the brain and those systems that are breaking the brain. Um, and when they get out of sync, dysfunction occurs. So... Step number two is that if you have an undiagnosed or untreated depression, anxiety, or burnout, you can't expect to sleep well until that is treated. So discuss that with your doctor. Now, there are many ways besides medication that you can help um, sorting out some of those conditions, but that's beyond the scope of this talk, which perhaps for another day. But love that picture on the right. Uh, is it on your right? Possibly on your right as well, yeah. So look at that brain. It, if you follow those steps, it'll show you what the brain goes through and the neurotransmitter fluctuations that occur during health to control wakening and sleeping. So you've got acetylcholine release, you've got uh, erexins and all sorts of things, and towards the night GABA gets released, um, and various parts of the brain are activated and shut down. There's a thing called the reticular activating system in the, in the brain stem. This is responsible for containing, controlling our arousal and our awareness. And um, this next slide makes an important point. A lot of what people are battling with in terms of sleep is a state of what's called hyperarousal. The, um, one of the main stimulatory neurotransmitters or catecholamine neurotransmitters in the brain is called norepinephrine. And one of the main seats of norepinephrine production is the locus ceruleus. There's a little structure called the locus ceruleus in your brainstem. That picture shows it nicely. And when this locus ceruleus produces norepinephrine, which is heightened during periods of stress, awareness, you know, being active, having a demand on you, it activates the cortex and switches off the sleep function. And a lot of depression is now believed to be a state of hyperarousal, and it has been so for a long time. To sleep well, we need to switch off at night. If we're in a state of constant vigilance, if our alarm signal is constantly firing, we're not going to be able to switch off and sleep well. So depression and anxiety are often states of hyperarousal. And many of the therapies that are of benefit with depressive states and anxiety states are interventions that settle down the hyperarousal system. So that's important. Um, point being, you need a balanced complement of neurotransmitters and you need to treat any underlying mental health imbalances like depression and anxiety to sleep well. Number three, we need balanced hormones. Hormones have a fundamental effect on the capacity of our brain to rest, regenerate and repair during sleep. Ladies can understand this when they go through menopause, they often find that their sleep gets disturbed. So replacing things like progesterone with bioidentical hormones and things like that, there's a place for that. And that can restore normal brain function when done um, with a practitioner who's experienced in these kind of modalities. But the point being is that hormones affect how our brain functions and how it sleeps. 
insulin and insulin resistance. Um, the more insulin we have around, the more inflamed we are. Inflammation affects sleep quality. Um, so inflammation is a threat or a stressor to your system and, and that causes the system to say, listen, there's a problem. So that will obviously affect your sleep quality. Leptin resistance we spoke about. So hormone imbalance is important in healthy sleep. Number four, this is a big one. Take home this, this, this slide because ensure nasal patency and identify and treat sleep disorder breathing. You and I were designed to breathe through our nose. Um, and it sounds so obvious to say that, but many people have become mouth breathers through chronic rhinitis, chronic allergies, deviated septums, broken noses, you name it. Um, a lot of people have reverted to becoming mouth breathers. And breathing through your nose and breathing through your mouth physiologically differ significantly. It's beyond the scope of this talk to go too much into it, but when we breathe through our mouth, we lose too much carbon dioxide. We're supposed to keep our carbon dioxide in certain levels. And... It's like the Goldilocks principle. It's supposed to be just right, not too much, not too little. And uh, one of the things that uh, CO2 does is it controls how effectively your tissues get oxygenated, how quickly your hemoglobin releases the oxygen at the tissue level. Um, and when it's at a certain level, it does that efficiently. When it's too low, it doesn't do that efficiently. Point being, breathing through your nose filters the air, it releases nitric oxide, which is good for your uh, blood pressure control. It's a, it's a good antimicrobial agent. It sterilizes the air, it humidifies the, humidifies the air. The brain is more relaxed when you breathe through your nose and when you breathe through your mouth. It affects the activity of neurons. So fundamentally important that we retain and optimize the capacity to breathe through our noses, and especially when we sleep. When your nose is blocked when you sleep, your likelihood of snoring it goes up dramatically. So sleep disordered breathing is common, and it's a common cause of sleep disruption. If you or your partner... Um, snores, get it investigated. The bigger, the more weight someone is carrying, the more likely they are to have a sleep disordered breathing condition. So there's varying degrees that, to which people obstruct their airways during sleep. Remember when we sleep, the muscles relax. Muscles in the throat relax, muscles in the upper airway relax, and tongue can fall back if you're lying on your back. So sleeping on your side is a good option. But if you make sure your nose is patent, you can breathe through your nose, it's clear, wash it out with saline, Stop eating things that you're allergic to. Dairy is a common culprit in terms of causing nasal congestion. Watch those dietary triggers that make your nose close up and avoid them. Flush out with Ceylon. Make sure that you're breathing through your nose um, and you will improve your quality of sleep. Obstructive sleep apnea has serious health consequences. You can get a thing called pulmonary hypertension, which can lead to a heart defect called col pulmonale, where the right side of the heart fails. That's worst case scenario. Um, so adjuncts are things like nasal sprays. Avoid nasal decongestants long term. You know those sprays we get when we all have a cold? Short term relief only. In excess, that will cause rebound congestion, not to be used long term. Um, MADs or mandibular advancement devices. If people find that when they fall asleep, their tongue falls back, they can use devices that advance the mandible and improve quality of sleep. Point is, if you snore, if you concerned that you're not breathing properly at night, you need to perhaps have a sleep study done, talk to your physician. It's not innocuous, fundamentally affects your, whether you're getting to deep sleep because your brain often wakes up and you're not getting to the deep restorative sleep. Um, very, very important cause of poor sleep. Number five, avoid stimulants. So caffeine is a, is a common drug of choice for most people these days. Many people don't or cannot start their day without caffeine. The way caffeine works, it works via the brain's adenosine receptor. One of the breaks of the brain we spoke about in excitation neurotransmitters, uh, another one is glutamate, and we, then we spoke about breaks, break neurotransmitters, and one of the breaks of the brain is called adenosine. When we produce energy from our food, we yield a substance called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. When that ATP breaks down, it forms a compound called adenosine. And over the course of the day, as you break down more ATP, the adenosine starts to make the brain feel sleepy towards the end of the day. And that's, how, that's part of the reason we start to feel tired. Caffeine, as most of you know, or many of you would know, is it blocks the adenosine receptor, but doesn't settle down the neuronal activity. So it doesn't allow adenosine to make you feel tired. So it's blocking the re normal receptor site. So it's almost like cutting the break of your brain. It's, um, so caffeine works, but it's like robbing Peter to pay Paul. You will, it's, a, it's, it's cashing a check you haven't earned, and you will pay for it somewhere along the line also makes your brain less sensitive to norepinephrine and more dependent on caffeine to stay alert. 
to, yeah, best to avoid caffeine. Alcohol has been found to decrease sleep latency. In other words, it decreases the amount of time it takes for you to fall asleep, but it's been shown scientifically to decrease the quality of your sleep and increase your risk of obstructive sleep apnea by making you more totally relaxed. Optimize nutrition. So the various nutritional factors that have a fundamental effect on our sleep quality, things like tryptophan, melatonin, gamma butyric acid or GABA, pyridoxine, ornithine, histamine, acetylcholine, um, B vitamins, zinc, um, magnesium is a big one. A lot of people are magnesium deficient because we're not eating enough greens. Magnesium is the center mineral of chlorophyll. So magnesium is to chlorophyll what iron is to hemoglobin for us in our blood. And magnesium is a nice relaxing mineral. Many of us, because we're not getting enough greens, are not getting enough um, magnesium. Another one that comes from greens is potassium. So the brain works on electricity and uh, it's an electrically, electricity generating organ. For you to be, you feel fired up, alive, enthusiastic, be able to concentrate, be happy, you need lots of electricity going on in the brain. And this electricity is generated by the ions or electrolytes that we get through our diet. Two of the major ones, or three of the major ones, are sodium, potassium, and chloride. And these ions are being differentially distributed across the membranes of our bodies and the neurons, for instance. And they flow in and out in various places, and that generates an electrical current. A lot of people have become deficient in potassium. Potassium is a nice, relaxing electrolyte. Potassium is rich in green foods. We need about 2,700 milligrams of potassium per day. Most people are not getting enough um, leafy greens and vegetables to get that in. So one needs to look at ways of increasing your vegetable and fruit intake and increasing your potassium intake. Very relaxing mineral. Point being is that your nutrition is a fundamental factor in providing the brain what it needs to generate the neurochemistry of sleep. That's important to understand. So the doables, I hope that wasn't too fast, but the doables. To sleep well, number one, choose it as a priority. You need to decide that you want to become a sleep master. Identify and treat any underlying brain imbalances with your doctor, we've touched on. Put your lights off early, no blue light at night. Identify and treat hormonal imbalances such as menopause. Uh, identify and treat sleep disordered breathing, snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Snoring is no joke, it's, it's dangerous. Optimize your nutritional status, including vitamin D. And that's the other thing about vitamin D. Um, vitamin D exposure in the morning, early part of the day. If, if you have to take a vitamin D supplement, for instance, to get your vitamin D level up, best is obviously to get it via sunlight, but if your level's very low, this place for supplementation. And taking that in the morning has been shown to have the most favorable effect on sleep at night. So time of dosing of certain nutrients. Wear a mask if you have to block, um, block out light. Monitor your sleep with a device and take steps to improve it. So many of us I've got this watch. I love to monitor my sleep and see how I'm doing. Um, when I get to sleep, you know, away, away from the hospital, I need to make sure I get the best bang for my buck. So I take steps to optimize my sleep nowadays and um, it makes such a difference when you do that. So I want to encourage you to take these tips, become practical about it, decide that you're going to prioritize your sleep from tonight. Your success in life depends on a healthy brain. A healthy brain, one of the key bases is healthy sleep. Be blessed and enjoy. Take care. I hope you plan to rest and get some more sleep from now on. A big thank you to Dr. Bruce for that session. And if you have any questions for Dr. Bruce or any speakers, please drop them in the comments below or hit the link in the description, which will take you to a Q&A form. A future Q&A event is planned. So to stay up to date and get more information, like this page. We are not done with this weekend yet. Rainier is back with us at 3 p.m where we'll look at practical nutritional principles. I'm sure we'll see you then. If this has been helpful to you, then please share this with some friends or family. We want to help as many people as we can. We'll see you again at 3 p.m. with Renir.